that he spends a good bit of time in the reading, in, in the stuff before what we read today, right, and in the stuff for today, criticizing traditional notions of difference. Right? The different way, the ways in which philosophers have treated difference, and for all of them, difference becomes secondary. It's difference is secondary to identity. And what he wants to do, right, is to show, and here's where Nietzsche comes in. I'm not, sur not surprised that this is where a lot of questions are. Nietzsche is the thinker for whom difference becomes primary and not secondary. So for Aristotle, difference is secondary, right? Uh, identity is primary. For Hegel, right, difference is secondary, identity is primary. I'm going to talk about each of these, right? Uh, for Nietzsche, right, there's difference. But now the question is why go back to Plato after this? One would think that you go to talk to Plato, about Plato before you talk about Nietzsche, right? But the move that he makes with Plato is to say, oddly enough, after we read Nietzsche, we can see Plato as opening the door to overturning his own philosophy. Right? But we can only see that after having seen Nietzsche. Right? So Nietzsche opens the door to, remember he says that, that, with Pla uh, that Plato opened the door to the overturning of Platonism. Right? So we will see that, right? but after we talk about Nietzsche and, and what, Nietzsche's what Nietzsche opens up, right? and Maria, it will be in Nietzsche that we start, that we're talking about difference in itself, right? Preceding identity, okay? Okay, but first, Aristotle, right? For Aristotle, differences were, again, secondary to what's primary. Right? Aristotle's thought is a thought of categories. So you have, for Aristotle, you have the higher categories, right? Which are the genera. Then, and I'm going to illustrate all this, right? Below that is species, and below that is individuals. Right. So the general will be the general groups. So for instance, right, among the genera will be colors, and this is going to sound strange, but it'll make sense in a minute, animals, right? These are two genera, right? General categories, color, animal. Now, among colors, you can have, for instance, white and black. Right? Among animals, right, say horses right, and whales. Okay? Now, white and black are species of the genera color. Right? Horses and whales, species of the genera animal, okay? Now, individuals, right, would be this white horse, or let's say, right, right, this white horse, right, that one over here that you can point to, right, that's an individual. Okay? It's an individual right, that has characters of that species, which come from that genera. Right? Or individual character of that species comes from that genera. Right? This white horse, that black whale, individuals. Right? That particular whale over there. Okay? Those are the individuals, members of species, right? members of genera. Right? So, does it make sense? You see the, you see the categories, right? Now, for Aristotle, where, will the, where does difference lie? <clears throat> well, it's going to be between different genera, right? between different species, and between different individuals. Right? That's where the differences are. In other words, you have this identity, this identity, right? these identities. Right? And difference is between the identities. In order to have difference, in order, you, in order to have difference, you must have identities first. Now let me stop a minute. Right? I want to make sure that that thought makes sense. Right? Right. Right. Aristotle's the thought of categories. In thinking about categories, okay, you have what is primary, which are the categories themselves, right? and at the highest level, those, right, they are the genera. And Difference emerges as what happens 
between, or better, as distinctions within various categories. There's no such thing as difference itself, and difference doesn't generate identity. Right? First you have identities, right? and difference happens between them. Let me, now, let me check in. And it, look, you're looking like there may be puzzle material. I'm not sure. I'm totally with you. You're totally with me. Yes. Right? Not just even a little bit. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, so don't be puzzled by my face. Okay. I'm just thinking. No, but I do notice your hands are where I can see. Um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, Anna, okay? Yes. Yeah. Good. Does anyone feel uncomfortable with this? Okay. Now, why, why go here? Remember one of the things that, that Deleuze is doing. One of essential tasks is to put forward a thought of difference as primary and identity as secondary. Right? And to do that, right, remember what we talked about last time, to do that in order to make, to undercut the primacy of identity, right? to s open up the possibility of richer ways of thinking and living. So what he's doing right, is he's analyzing how it is that difference has come down to us philosophically as a secondary category. And then he's, he's going to intervene in order to try to, in order to, try to switch it up. Right? Right. So his enga all of this engagement with the history of philosophy is an engagement seeking to show that the primary way of thinking of difference is as secondary to identities. <laughs> right? Let's make sure you see what... The primary way of thinking about differences is secondary, yes? Yes, as secondary. Yeah. Yes. All right. Oh, I, I, yes. I got you. Okay. Um, okay. So, so he, 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 uh, he'll look at major figures, right? Aristotle being one of the first. Now, Hegel is in the reading. Go ahead, stand. Is it, um, is it Aristotle that also makes the distinction between the general and the particular? Yes. And the singular? Uh, well, no, Hegel also does that. Hegel? Yeah. But Aristotle does it before. Aristotle does it, but he does it differently from Hegel. Yeah. Right? That Hegel also makes a distinction between general, right, uh, uh, particular, specific and particular. Right? Um, I'm gonna, when I'm working with Hegel, I'm going to work less with that, which I think is closer to, to Aristotle, and more with the dialectic. Right? Uh, which is, I think, the, where the... the point at which Deleuze sees himself the furthest from, uh, from actually any philosopher. The strange thing about Hegel is that for um, Deleuze, of all of the philosophical enemies he had, right, he considered Hegel right, the one who was his greatest enemy. Right? Uh, the, uh, um, the Hegel's notion of dialectic, which, I'm gonna, which I'll talk about, what it is, and, and, and that's where we're going to see opposition, opposition in the negative. Right? That Hegel's notion of dialectic as involving opposition and the negative was the thing he criticized the most. Right? Uh, which, by the way, uh, is ironic, right? Because he found himself in opposition to mm -hmm. the thought of opposition. Right? But, right, that irony aside, right? Um, let, let's turn to Hegel. Okay? Now, there is a, a, a standard reading of Hegel, which is, I, I think, not a, it's not a terribly precise one. I'll, I'm going to give it to you as a, as, as a frame, but then I want to talk about why it's, we, we need, I think, to make it a little bit more uh, complicated than the, standard, uh, uh, than the standard picture. But it is something like that standard picture that Deleuze is, uh, is in opposition to, partly because Hegel thinks, sees himself as working through or by means of difference. He sees things as unfolding by means of difference, but he still has difference right, subordinated to identity. Right. And that's why he, th for him difference is opposition. All right, but now, right, so, so uh, 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 posting stamp Hegel. For Hegel, history does not proceed in a linear fashion, step by step by step, right, for moving forward. Right? It proceeds, he says, dialectically. And that term dialectic, which appears in Socrates, appears elsewhere, right, 
uh, the notion of the dialectic, right, uh, in Hegel's hands, takes on a certain form which it had not had before. So I'm going to give you the form right, and an example. Okay. So the form is that you, you start with a situation, a specific situation. And that situation generates its own opposition. So situations are internally unstable, and they generate their own opposition. And who says this? This is Hegel now. Oh. This is Hegel. Right. Right. Yeah. Again, uh, and this is not the lose on Hegel, this is, this is Hegel on Hegel. Okay? Okay. The, um, the, so, the, so the situation generates right, its own opposition. Now you have an unstable situation of conflict. It has to be resolved, right? and it gets resolved into a new situation. That new situation will have its own instabilities, generate its own, own opposition, right? there'll be conflict, you'll get a new situation. What's, the way it's often put, that, that I think is accurate to Hegel. Right? The way it's often put, is that you have the, new, the situation called the synthesis. I mean, so the, the, the thesis, right? You have a, okay, this is Hegel now. Let's do this, right? And it's Hegel, right? You have a thesis. That's the situation, right? The thesis generates its own opposition, right? Antithesis. Right. The tension between these has to be resolved, it gets resolved in a new situation, which is the synthesis. And the synthesis becomes a new thesis. Right? And the movement starts again. Now, let me illustrate this with a couple of things. Um, here's a, uh, let me give you an everyday example, then I'll give you sort of a more historical example. Right? The everyday example is, is you know, um, Right? You meet someone, right? and you're attracted to them. Right? And you start right, forming a relationship, and you know they're great. Right? Like everything about them is great, and nothing about them could possibly ever be wrong. Right? <laughs> and you wonder how anybody ever felt right, like that, that this person had any flaws, because clearly they don't. Right? <laughs> right? And then something happens. Right? And you revisit your earlier judgment on this. Right? And now the flaws appear. Right? And they appear more salient, more relevant right? than, the, uh, than the initial attraction. And this is the moment you want, what was I thinking? Right? What was I seeing with this person? Right? Now you've got the internal tension. Right? And one of two things is going to happen. Right? Either the relationship is split apart, but let's assume it doesn't split apart. Right? Then you form a new and more nuanced view of the, of the person. Now as a person, who has right, positive characteristics, but also flaws, and one uh, right, learns to sort of uh, one learns to navigate that, right? And as re this, as relationships develop, they, one way to see them is developing dialectically, right? right? In which right, the in which you get more and more nuanced relationship with the uh, with your person uh, with the person that you're with, right? Because right. Uh, each, no particular view of them is that stable, right? And so you have, there's always a tension leading to something else, okay? Right, that's one way. That, that's one example, right? Well, this would be a bit of review. For Nietzsche, there are, in constituting history, fundamentally two types of forces. There are active forces and reactive forces. Do you remember, right? You've been through this more than once, right? right? Do you want to take this part? And I'll just sit. Okay. <laughs> Was that? No, I'm fine. Okay. Um, okay. Active forces are forces that are created. They they create something. Right? Reactive forces. 
react against active forces. Again, I'm going to give you examples. But Nietzsche thinks that history is driven fundamentally by, I'm going to use the term, but I'm going to half take it back in a minute, right? Con the conflict, that's the term I'm going to half take back, between active and reactive forces. And the reason I need to half take it back is that active forces are not in conflict with the reactive forces. Right? Only reactive forces are in conflict with active forces. So what's an active force? An active force is simply a force of creation. Right? It, an active force does what it does. Kind of active forces. It's simply a force of creation. It just creates whatever, whatever it creates. Again, I'm, uh, you know, and I'm speaking generally now, and then we'll put some examples on the table. Right? It just it, 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 it works by, um, uh, an active force uh, works by, you could say, following its own path. Mm -hmm. Okay. A reactive force doesn't follow its own path. In fact, it doesn't have its own path to follow. A reactive force works by trying to stop an active force from doing what it does. That is to say, it reacts to an active force. Now, I want to use a couple of examples. Benedicta, here's where art's going to begin to come up. Okay? Because I, 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 sometimes I think of art as, as a, a, a good example uh, of this. But I'm not going to use just art, but I'll use that as well. Um, in, you guys are all familiar, with, I mean, broadly familiar with Impressionism, you know, Monet and stuff like that, right? right? And it was really controversial, right? It was, it was, it was when, it, when Monet and Manet and those folks started to paint, right, they were roundly rejected by, it was the previous generation, which were the realists. And when they were rejected, uh, well, part of the rejection was that you would have these big exhibits in France, they called them salons, yeah, these big salons, and they would submit art, their art, the impressions, to the salons, and, and they were always refused. They were always turned down. So what they did was they organized their own salon, and it was called the Salon de Refusé, right? The Salon of the Refused. And they exhibited their art. And this is how it caught on. Right? Through, the, through the exhibits of the, the, uh, the Salon de Refusé. Right? Now, think of what was going on here. Think of this movement that the Impressionists made. Right? First, they created an art that sought not to be in opposition to previous art. The, the, the central claim of the Impressionists was that visual experience is a product of light. So as light changes, visual experience changes. So you know, like in the, um, Monet would paint, the, he'd paint the same thing, the same scene, at different times of day, right? So there's these cathedrals, right? There, there was, there was um, a, a great sort of alignment at one point, there's this old museum in Paris that is, actually doesn't exist any longer, but the, and it had a set of Monet cathedrals, right? From dawn, right, to night. And each one looks different, right, because the light's different. So the creative claim, if I could put it that way, of the Impressionists, the creative, their creative claim was that vision works through light. And that painting, if it's going to capture vision, is it's going to capture it through the rendering of light. Right. This idea, this central claim was rejected. Right. And rather than write oppositional manifestos, what did the professionists do? Right. They just followed their path. Right. They went and formed right, their own salon right, in order to display their own work. 
In that sense, we could say, right, the impressionist <laughs> movement seemed to be one of an active force, an active creative force. Opposed to it was the traditional, uh, was it, the traditional Parisian art establishment. And they did their level best to denigrate it, right, to say it wasn't real art. Right? Um, uh, and this, by the way, I mean, and you guys know this happens every generation, right? Right? That the previous generation says that that's not real art, right? Uh, um, in my case, it was uh, when my, uh, my grandmother right, took me to see Jackson Pollock, you know, you know Jackson Pollock, right? Do, do, do you, know, you know his nickname? You know, everybody knows Jackson Pollock, right? Do you know the nickname? Do you know? They, Jack the Dripper? <laughs> right? so, yeah. um, and by the way, uh, the, um, uh, the people talk, oh, anybody can do this. And my grandmother said that, right? Oh, anybody can do this. But, but, but they actually set people up. They gave them paint, right? It turns out it's not so easy, right? People were not actually able to create those lines in the way that he, I mean, he had a sort of, I mean, whether you like it or not, he had a certain technique, right, that was actually very difficult to replicate. But in any case, it's not art, right? right? That's the reactive attitude, right? I react against this thing. Right. So now, Benedict, this is, that's the, uh, I'm going to come back to art again, right? 